Amen. So welcome back. Elder Tabo just made an announcement about how we will handle the interactions. Um, as far as the questions I ask going, that I ask uh, when you answer them, to put them in this chat box that you find uh, to the right of your screen if it's open. And then if you have specific different questions back to ask me to then use the Q&A box. So with those questions, uh, as people post them in the Q&A box, I don't mind if they don't directly relate to what we're studying now. So please don't be afraid to put some other thoughts in there. We may, it may be that we can't get to them at this Sabbath, but when we know what questions people have, we know what to do in other presentations at other Sabbaths, uh, in private messages if people need, or it might be that the presentations are already heading into a discussion of those subjects uh, and we will know better what questions have as we present. So please don't be afraid to put questions in the Q&A box. If they don't get answered directly, that they'll be in our minds and they may get answered in uh, some later presentations. So welcome back. Um, we left off yesterday discussing uh, where we are in our current dispensation and going through different lines that illustrate that. I think the more that we look at the external events as they relate to not just to uh, the United States, but worldwide, as we can see how worldwide the issues are now, it really helps us um, understand why we need the lines. There is a complexity, a messiness to what happens externally. Nothing is neat anymore, especially in, a, in an information war or in an information age. There is such an amount of information, so many different perspectives of that information. And even the way countries fight in an information war that makes this history much more difficult to see clearly unless we use parable teaching and lines. Just to give an example of that, we've discussed over the last weeks in Australia, uh, I think we've done, uh, there might be about six weeks worth of, of Sabbaths where I was presenting and we went through the history of Protestantism. And I didn't, I, I kind of, hinted at this, we didn't go into a complete discussion of that subject, but going back to 18, the, the early 1800s, what argument were Protestants making in America? The Protestants, strong conservative Protestants in America, they didn't then use the term evangelical. Uh, the, the terms have kind of morphed and developed over time, but the conservative Protestant faction in America in the early 1800s, what was their position on the Constitution? Their position on the Constitution through most of the 1800s was that it was a worldly, satanic document. The Constitution nowhere honored God. It didn't mention God as being, um, the, the force behind the United States, it didn't mention that the United States owed allegiance to God, had um, respect for his authority and his laws. The fact that God was left out of the Constitution to such a degree for them made this, the, the Constitution essentially like a satanic document. And they attacked the Constitution through the early 1800s. Then they come to the late 1800s, and we all know the Sunday law crisis. Their position then became quite emphatic. The thing to do with the Constitution was not to abolish it, but to amend it. Now they want the Constitution amended, to put in an amendment that says, by the way, we haven't said it before, but we're saying it now. The United States is a Christian nation run by Christian 
biblical law and morality. So this was the Christian amendment. It was much larger than, a, than just writing uh, a, a Sunday law. That whole movement, the, the, the issue of a Sunday law in Congress was part of that discussion. But behind all of that Sunday law history, what they're really pushing for, what they really want is an amendment to the constitution. In our history, what is the Protestant definition of, what is the P Protestant view of the constitution? Their view of the constitution now is that it was always Christian. It was Christian from the very beginning. It just matters how you read. So now they're going to say, go back to history. The founding fathers were st strong Protestants. They weren't theists. They wrote it with, with God in mind that this is a Christian nation. So when they call for the separation of church and state, it's like a one-way war. It's so Protestantism has freedom from the state but only Protestantism, that there is nothing in this freedom that is meant to be of benefit to the religions that by that, that stage hadn't even entered into the United States. So the, the, the Protestant perspective of the constitution has morphed over time, going from that idea that the constitution is satanic to we can fix this, we can amend it, to it needs no amendment because it's always been Christian and people just don't use it correctly. As you might expect, the argument they're making now in the history of an information age, in the context of an information war is much harder to refute. When they were saying the constitution is satanic, then it's easy. You're either for the constitution or against the constitution. Now the argument is more complex. Now both sides are saying, we love the constitution. The constitution is correct the way it is. It all depends on how you read. Because we're in this information age, we need lines and these histories so much more. Back when the United States a whole coalition fought against Nazi Germany, it's really easy to see the lines drawn, the battlefield. In the Cold War, it's still easier to see. It's a Cold War, it's an information war, but you still have this easy divide between East and West. Now it's so much harder. Now it's an information war. Now if you go to a Republican, now, if you go to uh, Paul Manafort or Roger Stone and say, there is a cold war between the United States and Russia, there is an information war over spheres of influence, what do they say? Depends how you read external events. There's a deniability. Back in 1799, all the French people know, we have the establishing of a dictatorship especially when you come into the early 1800s, you already have Napoleon establishing a dictatorship. When you see dictatorships established through history, when you see Stalin, people know that they have a dictator. Now with Vladimir Putin, if you ask the average Russian, does your country have a dictator? Will they say yes or no? It depends. It depends how you read the actions of Vladimir Putin. We need lines to make sense of what is, has become much more complex as we get towards the end of Earth's history and the end of the great controversy. So we're looking at what these lines are and we're being a little bit more focused because these lines are explaining a particular dispensation that we are in as priests. Our last dispensation as priests, the time of trouble. And it has particular challenges associated with it. We are quite some months in to 
this dispensation and many people are struggling. I want us to understand more completely why we are struggling, why this dispensation is so hard for us. So we've been through a few of the lines that we are given. We looked really at the, the template. The way Ellen White describes Jacob's time of trouble, and we looked at that quite quickly. We saw close of probation to second advent, Jacob's time of trouble, and what we particularly focused on was the, was the phrase, that paragraph, where she said, every earthly support is cut off. I know those lines are a little hard to see from the board. Uh, photos will be taken in the break so that they can be more visible. We saw no earthly support in that history. We saw what that meant in that history while we recognize it was written in the context of the great controversy um, between the 1888 version and the 1911 version being released. Uh, we found that in Desire of Ages chapter 12. Then we looked at the chapter that she was writing, that she wrote that story in. And the chapter is titled The Temptation. So what Ellen White has done, she has taken the, the time of trouble and compared it and contrasted it with the experience of Christ in the wilderness time period, in that 40 days. That's something we've already been doing in this movement for some time, quite some time, over a year. But we understood we did that as a fractal. So we went to the, our two lines of the end of ancient Israel. We have the experience of the disciples that we live as the first group called. We then have the experience of Christ, the first priest after the order of Melchizedek and how he establishes that priesthood. So we have the story of the disciples and then we have the, the story of the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Two different parables we can take from the same history and put on two separate lines. That connects the history directly after Gethsemane and the cross with the history of Christ in the wilderness. The history after the cross being the time of trouble for the disciples. So we have time of trouble, all earthly support cut off, Christ's experience in the wilderness, where Ellen White uh, compares on contrasts. Then we have the experience of the disciples after the cross, their time, their 40 days between the cross and Christ's ascension. So we could go into those histories in much more detail. For time, in this camp meeting, we won't go into most of these histories with that degree of detail, but it's worth doing. Then we went to a dream that Ellen White had. We wanted to consider what it means to have every earthly support cut off. We began that dream in 1989, where a portion of a large body go on a journey. We said that large body was the mountain of Daniel 2. The portion is the stone that is cut out. That large mountain is Adventism. The stone is a group of people who are going to go on this journey, that portion. They started with all of their wagons, all of their materials loaded on the, those wagons, drawn by horses, dressed in preparation to go up this path, shoes on their feet stockings on their legs. They go on this path that's ascending between, wedged between a high white wall and this valley beneath them, this, this great crevice. The path narrows as it ascends. It gets more and more narrow to the point where they must cut the wagons from the horses and leave them behind. So first they leave the wagons and some of their goods. 
they strap some of their things to the horses and they proceed on horseback. It gets to the stage where the luggage is driving them towards the edge of the cliff. The path is narrowing, it's making their load too wide. So they leave behind their luggage. Then they get to this point. At this point, they realize the horses must be left behind. It's narrowed again. So they get off the horses, they leave the horses behind and they proceed on foot. At that same point in time as they begin their journey on foot, there are these cords that are released over the top of the wall. They do not see the top of that wall. It's above their eyes. They don't know what these cords are attached to over the wall, but they find that these cords hold them. They offer them stability. So proceed on their journey on holding onto these cords. I don't know who here has gone rock climbing. It, I used to love to rock climb. Um, and you really quickly realize that shoes are not a benefit to you when you're trying to hold on to small parts in a rock wall. When the path narrows, very few things grip as well as your feet. So they take off their shoes and they proceed in their stockings. They can get better grip this way. So they're proceeding in their stockings. From here, they leave behind their shoes. It gets to the point where they must go in bare feet. They need that grip. So they take off their stockings. Then they proceed barefoot. Now, when you rock climb, you know that if you just go barefoot, unless you, unless you have very strong feet, it cuts, it hurts. So you, what is, tends to be uh, worn are special shoes for that purpose that mold quite closely to your feet, and, but, but they're quite thin. They enable you to still be able to grip with your toes. You can still use your, your toes or parts of your foot through this shoe, but it offers protection. They don't have those. They're barefoot. They need that grip. At this point in time, Ellen White speaks of those who leave at every part along this journey. So we march the beginning of the journey at the time of the end. That's when a group begins to be formed and called out. We have the two way marks of that dispensation. We come to 9-11, the cords are let down. The cords being the lines, being parable teaching. They are, are the specific tool and characteristic of the second angel. Right when she starts to speak about those behind at every point who are not prepared for hardship, it's in a history between the way marks of 2012 and 2014 to begin to experience major shakings in this movement. 2014, they get to the point here where the path has narrowed so much, she says, it gets to the point they have to suspend almost their whole weight from these cords. And the people are quite joyful in this history. There's quite a lot of confidence in this history of the Sunday law history of the latter rain. People are shouting, we have hold from above. So they don't know what holds the cords at the top of the wall but they don't mind that in this history. At this point in time, that's okay with them. They just know that the lines are secure, that the cords are secure. So there's a degree of confidence. They can suspend their weight upon the cords. They say, we have hold from above, but they are still able to have some grip uh, along this ever narrowing path. These cords increase in size. They cannot just be held by the hands anymore. There are things that are moving with you as you walk and you are holding onto with your whole body. Ellen White begins to notice blood along this white wall. As I said before, if you're going to rock climb, it tends to wear specially made shoes. You're going to cut your feet. 
And what she's seeing here is that this path has hurt the people in front of her. And yet she sees it is just as it should be. That blood encourages those coming along before. Others have passed this journey before us and they made it to the other end. So can we. Then they come to the chasm. And as Ellen White describes their experience, standing, pausing at the edge of this chasm, she uses the language, same language that we find expressed in the history of both Christ in the wilderness and Christ at Gethsemane and the cross. We've reached the time of trouble. We've reached 2019. The portion from her dream. My husband was just before me. The large drops of sweat were falling from his brow. The veins in his neck and temples were increased to double their usual size and suppressed agonized groans came from his lips. The sweat was dropping from my face and I felt such anguish as I have never felt before. A fearful struggle was before us. If we failed here, all the difficulties of our journey had been experienced for naught. So I won't go into the history of Gethsemane and the cross. I think we're all somewhat familiar with that experience. I will quote uh, from CSA 32.6. CSA 32.6. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. So in this quote, she compares Christ's final test to Gethsemane and the cross with the temptation in the wilderness. Last quote for this subject is in CTR 192.4. Christ triumphant 192.4. When Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. He did not invite temptation. He went into the wilderness to be alone, to contemplate his mission and work. By fasting and prayer, he was to brace himself for the blood-stained path he must travel. But Satan knew that the Saviour had gone into the wilderness, and he thought this was the best time to approach him. Weak and emaciated from hunger, Worn and haggard with mental agony, Christ's visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. All I want to take from that paragraph, because we, we went over this history at the school and camp meetings in Uganda. What I want us to see is that experience in the wilderness is mirrored in the experience of Gethsemane and the cross. The reason we need to see it in the time period of the wilderness is that this was not something that happened for this movement, that this movement is experiencing in a matter of hours or one day. Someone asked the question yesterday about the temptations of Christ occurring just in a matter of hours. And we discussed how that test will not come to this movement in not even just in one day. It becomes a theme of that time period. So this experience as I stand on the edge of the chasm isn't just happening on November 9. It's not a one day experience. It's happening in the context of the whole wilderness time period. It's a characteristic of the time of trouble.
we're going to come back possibly tomorrow and discuss that wilderness time period. Uh, but I just wanted us to have that anchor, that quote that demonstrates the, the, the experience of Christ in the wilderness because the Bible doesn't give us that much details. He fasted for 40 days. That sounds hard. When Ellen White describes it, she describes that the weakness, the emaciation, the hunger, the mental agony. Just as we find marked in Gethsemane, which she compares and contrasts it to, and in the dream. So we discussed what they had to, to experience in this time of trouble in her dream, crossing from one side of, of the chasm to the other side, crossing to what she experienced describes as being a land that cannot be described by anything earthly that is not lit by the sun this is crossing from the close of probation through time of trouble to the second ad and that history is described as having no earthly support we can describe it as people having to let go of their worldliness or their earthliness subtly the same thing we discussed then what that earthliness is. We can keep it on the line of the movement and speak about our preconceived ideas about the nature of the kingdom. Those preconceived ideas being uh, really taking us on two different roads in two different directions off of the path. We'll discuss more about that later. But then we also applied it personally. We have to apply this personally. If the movement is experiencing that, we are experiencing that. We have to come to terms with the fact we are not fit for duty. I think many people in this movement feel that now that we have the message of equality, we have it all together and we're fit for duty. And my fear is many of the people sharing that message speaking equality are failing the exact test that they're speaking about there is a danger that people think they are passing the test when in fact they are are failing it the lines tell us that depending on whether or not we're willing to open our eyes we can see that Sister asked, does the wilderness experience end at the increase of knowledge way mark? Yes, I would suggest that it does. But we need multiple parables to explain that history. We're still in the time of trouble. I don't think all issues end at the end of that wilderness time period. But what begins to be given is bread begins to be given back. That's when the angels descend and they feed Christ. And that gives him strength to go on to Cana, then to go on to the first temple cleansing. He receives again strength to endure. So what I will do is I will erase this line now of that dream and I'll place it just under our lines that we're collecting over here uh, that are all one dispensation. This is all the harvest of the priests. So if you give me a moment, I'll erase this, this dream.
So I've already drawn that up here. We have the path. At the end of the path, they start to ask who holds the cords. Going back to the history of that ladder rain experience, they're not described as asking that. They say we have hold from above. Now they're asking who's holding. That doubt is introduced because never before have they had to, um, never before have they had to put their entire weight upon those cords. They've never had to completely let go of that path and trust that the cords will hold them. So we have that experience of the chasm. Who holds the cords? Then they are finally able to say, God holds the cords. Once they step out in faith, they are led across that chasm. We then described what those cords are. Those cords are our lines. They are the parable teaching that happens under the second angel from 9-11 through the midnight crime message. It's parable teaching, but parables are just another expression, a more definite description of what we have called line upon line. So we understand that these lines traveled with them. They held them all along their way from 9-11. And now what gets us to this time period what brings us to this time period, gets us through it, is those lines, the same ones that we have been teaching for some time. It is, has not been the right time in the last six, eight months to expect a, a new message to come to, to God's people. We are in the time period when there was no bread, when that left this movement weak and emaciated from hunger. It was not a time period when we could have had a message like that of July 18, despite the fact, separate to the fact, it's not built upon parable methodology. We could not have such a message in that time period. The only thing that will get us through the time of trouble is trusting in parables and the lines. A sister asked, how do I know if I'm failing the test of equality? What are the signs? It's how much we're willing to trust the lines. And I know people, some people are just telling me now, we won't watch you anymore. You just keep repeating yourself. I think because people don't realize how much they need to trust the lines. There's a, 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 a kind of like a social commentator that I think has done a good job highlighting the problems with the media in America, the growing partisanship, the problems, different problems with both left-wing and right-wing media. I think many of you know him. His name is John Stewart. So I know that he's primarily a comedian, but he became a social commentator since 1999 and what he would say about Fox News prepared a lot of people. What I don't think, what I think we need to realize is as the message was taught last year, it was specifically targeting people in the movement who held on to strong conservative biases. They were right leaning nationalistic people. So the message had to be so clear, so cutting against that type of worldview, against nationalism, against sexism and homophobia. None of that is incorrect. It was strong then, it would be taught just as firmly today. But for people to understand that clearly, we had to make very black and white statements. Right wing news bad, left wing news good. Trump bad, Obama and Clinton, good. It had to be cutting. As we get into a new dispensation, that is starting to be refined. 
We have to see the problems with left-wing media. We have to see the problems with left-wing leaders, with Obama and Clinton. I brought up John Stewart because he said something recently in an interview. A man was, uh, was interviewing him, asking him about the political climate in America. And John Stewart gave quite a bit of background back into the years of George Bush and Obama and how they handled free speech. And he said that as he presented his, his show, he started getting called into the White House because he was saying things on his show that were, were quite incendiary against the president. He was speaking against the White House. He was humiliating the president, pointing out inconsistencies and hypocrisies with the administration. And he started getting in trouble with the White House. And he didn't want to go into much detail. He started getting really quiet. The interviewer asked, who was the president? And he said, Obama. It was this little quiet period. And then he said, it's really funny until it's your guy. That's the problem he faced and we face. Trump is wicked. We can see that. People have no problem externally, I hope we have a problem internally, of speaking in an inflammatory, argumentative, disrespectful fashion against Trump. But then there's the problem with Obama and Clinton. And it's all funny, it's all okay, it's okay to criticize until it's your guy. So when I say trust in the lions, that's really easy to say and to see when those lions are telling you there is no July 18 attack on Nashville. It's really easy to see, say, trust in the lions when they say black and white racism in America is wrong. It starts getting a lot harder. People in this movement now start making excuses when we say trust the lions, don't protest, don't post incendiary messages, don't join a left-wing movement, keep reforms. When you start saying those things and say trust the lions, then the excuses come. Then people start to say, yes, but I'm a citizen of two countries, God's country and my country. Since when did the kingdom of God offer dual citizenship? Never has, never will. When I say we are to trust in the lions and they are the only thing that will get us through this time period, the reason people think that is an easy statement to follow is because they don't realize, realize the lions condemn their own practices today. It's no longer... FFA that's the issue. FFA is mean and gone. I don't think about us having a fight with Future for America. That split is over. Now, when we must trust the lions, it's not that we reject July 18, it's what they're telling us about our experience right now, about how we are expected to behave right now. A sister has asked, should we wait to pass the increase of knowledge to study about the LGBT people? Our message will be very similar to that defended by the movements of the world about themselves. I don't quite get the second question. The first question, people can study as they like, but should we be fighting about this subject online in debates? The lines say no. So why are we? It's because people don't trust the lines. They don't apply the lines to themselves. They apply them to other people. They apply them to those social conservatives that they know in their friends and their family and their colleagues and acquaintances in Adventism and the world in Future for America. They don't apply them to themselves and hold themselves to the same standard.
So we're going back to the lions. We discussed the chasm. They're the only thing that will take us from the, the way mark of the close of probation to the second advent. From 2019 to 2021. Then we began to discuss some others. We placed Acts 27 in here. We went briefly over those two lines in Acts 27. between the increase of knowledge and the formalization of the Sunday law. That was from when Paul gave the message to the ship, there will be a shipwreck. And when at midnight they finally saw that, um, they finally saw land and were able to calculate the distance. We moved on from Acts 27. I briefly just want to remind us where we are in uh, the beginning of modern Israel. October 22, 1844. We've just passed that point. I've intentionally not marked the, the end of their dispensation in that history because that would require a, another study. Then we moved on to the revolutions. And this really, we, we springboarded from Millerite history into the subject of the revolutions because we actually came to that study through Millerite history. We went through um, the, how they had identified themselves as walking through the parable of the 10 virgins. And we still have that drawn above. We drew the line 144,000. Underneath, we put their experience, how uh, that they have experienced the tarrying time, April 19, the tarrying, we line up with 9 11. Then 2014, uh, in its primary sense, is July, 12, uh, July 21. This midpoint of that history, that experience of the 10 virgins described in the parable as midway. Then it comes to its conclusion, a shut door, October 22, 1844, lining up with 2019 in its primary sense. First group called beginning of modern Israel, priests are the first group called end of modern Israel. So we understood that those three way marks, carrying, midnight cry, shut door, are all symbols taken from Matthew 25. And the symbol that we particularly wanted to pick up on was July 21st, midnight and midway. Just before we were closing and, and then our review will be completed, we looked at, uh, we drew it this way. July 21 is midway in that history. 9-11 to the Sunday law in our own, April 19 to October 22 in theirs. It is literally midway. When we make application, we bring it over here. It makes 2014 symbolically midway, midway or midnight. So we're taking the literal to the symbolic rules of parable teaching. Take a literal story, make a, a spiritual 
or symbolic application. So 2014 is midnight or midway on our reform line. This was how it originally developed, the study of the revolutions, identifying 2014 as midway. But then how was 2014 first come to as a waymark? Again, we're going to go through quickly. We just want to remind ourselves of some key points. 2014 was come to as a waymark through a deeper, more thorough study and understanding of the 2520, the key that unlocks time, particularly as it relates to the 126 and the 151 and prophetic time spans. So in 2018, as we studied this subject of 2014 and prophetic time spans, the following was observed. The 151 to 2014 takes you back to 1863. So what have we just done here? We've made a, a application, a parabolic application from literal to spiritual. So when you go back to 1863, it is a midway point. It is literally midway in the history of a revolution. When you make application, is it literally midway, is 2014 literally midway in the history of a revolution? No. But the rules of parable teaching require you to go from literal to symbolic. So literally midway in the history from which you are making the application, whether that is July 21st, it's literally midway, lines up with that way mark, 1863, literally midway, and one more taking us back to the, through the 220 uh, associated with our restoration. It takes us to 1794, which is literally midway in the history of a revolution. So you have midway literally in in every history that's that is being applied in, in using the rules of parable teaching july 21st literally midway 1784 literally midway 1863 literally midway and what those histories enable us to do is have a more thorough understanding of 9 11 to 2019, over covering two dispensations, the early reign and the latter reign, the growth of the crop of the, the priests. It covers those two dispensations in two parts. 
and it describes it externally as being a history of revolution that by the end of that revolution results in the placement of a dictatorship. 1799 was the, establish, the establishment of Napoleon, who was a dictator. So a history of revolution that overthrows the, the common order, resulting in a dictatorship. This civil war in America, just another way of describing a revolution, by 1865 came to its completion and resulted in an, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and the establishment of Andrew Johnson. So the, the core subject of that 1863 history is the rise of church and state. It's taking us from 1863 as, a, um, as that Sunday law history. But you can also see that it gives that to us in the context of a revolution happening inside America. Church and state comes together partly as a result of this internal conflict. So that American Civil War history is more complex, relating primarily to church and state, but that happens in the, the context of an American revolution between North and South. So what we did then was then go into a more thorough understand or study of revolutions in history. We have some specific, um, some specific revolutions famous to us. The French Revolution, the German Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Uh, French, German, Russian, also the American Civil War, it's an, a revolution, and also the American revolution of the 1700s. We brought together a study of those five histories, the French Revolution in two parts, so it became a sixth, and that combined to give us a repeating pattern of what to expect to experience in revolution in our own day, in its application. So we're out of time for this presentation. We're going to have a, a short break, I'll close in a prayer, and then we'll come back and we will uh, complete our study on those, on uh, our, our fast revision of the, those revolutionary time periods, uh, mostly discussing the application. If you kneel with me, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for our blessings. Thank you that we can come together over different time zones far away. Lord, you know the danger that we are walking through. You have done your utmost to have us prepared, to have us fitted for this journey. I pray, Lord, that we will be willing to carry that cross, that we will see that for the glory of your kingdom, for the just for, for the um, for people to see your character as it truly is and find salvation, Lord, that the burdens that we are carrying, Lord, are are not too great to bear. I pray that we'll have that love for other souls, souls inside the movement, souls that are new, souls that are weak in the faith, souls that are yet to come in but are already around us ready to to hear this message that we will consider our own responsibility to put no stumbling block in front of their path lord i pray that we will have that love that love that the midnight cry message was designed to give us that we are careful in our words and our actions may we see our responsibility more clearly and i pray lord that we will trust these lines i pray this in jesus name amen